So yes, welcome to, to this Timber Grid Shells um, masterclass. Um, very happy to be here. Um, as Enrique briefly mentioned, uh, the beginning of my career was spent at the University of Bath <clears throat> uh, doing research uh, at first on timber grid shells uh, with Chris Williams and Richard Harris. Uh, and then I did my PhD there looking at equilibrium shape of, of curved strips and tapered rods. Um, which is something I'm not going to go into today, but um, yeah. And then afterwards I moved to Bollinger Groman in Berlin, uh, where I spent a couple of years and later on AKT in London, um, doing computational design, structural engineering uh, at all levels. So competition concept, detail construction, and when the boss is allowed uh, a bit of R&D as well. Um, <clears throat> So that's something briefly about me. And then we can dive straight into um, the topic of uh, form finding. Um, sorry, is there a way to see the, uh, like your faces as well while I'm sharing? Not really, right? Just if you have it on the screen. Ah, okay, no, I don't, cool. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, and another item, maybe if if you want to interrupt with a question or something, uh, feel free to do that. So back to form finding. Um, I like to to begin these kind of talks and talk about the word form and the fact that I like that it's you know it has a lot of synonyms. Uh, it's a noun, but uh, equally important is the fact that it's also a verb um, and it originates from both a noun and a verb, which means it has a, this duality of um, a process and a result. So I think it's important <clears throat> when you talk about grid shells um, and lightweight structures generally, um, not only the result is important, but also the, the process by which you get to it. Um, I like to recommend this book um, in case you haven't heard of it, On Growth and Form by, by Darcy Thompson. This book was written in 1917. Um, it was a time when, you know, microscopes, telescopes had been invented, x-rays maybe even. <clears throat> so people started looking at, um, you know, the ways in which natural forms occur, how biology behaves. Uh, and Darcy Thompson was um, explaining these processes in his book, uh, looking at morphology. <clears throat> And he talks about the waves of the sea, the little ripples on the shore, the sweeping curve of the sandy bay as riddles of form that can be solved by reference to their antecedent phenomena in the material system of mechanical forces to which they belong. So he's talking about, you know, this seashell um, is like this because it's been formed by certain processes. And what are those processes is equally as important. The book is, is fantastic. It has a lot of beautiful uh, diagrams like this. Um, <clears throat> he was looking at different species of fish and how they can relate to each other, how they have evolved due to different environmental, uh, mechanical conditions, uh, things of that nature. He also looked at, um, I don't even know what these things are, probably some coral type um, formations. Um, and an analogy with um, with a splash, so um, behavior of liquids, which might lead to the emergence of these kinds of shapes. So I thoroughly recommend this this book. Um, another favorite of mine, <clears throat> which is a more modern version, is um, the Architecture of Emergence by Michael Weinstock, who teaches at the AA in London. Um, and similarly, he talks about uh, the need that the need for um, studying change when you study form. He talks about a, a kind of a larger <clears throat> ecosystem of uh, energy, information, and materials, um, which uh, you know create the forms uh, that we have in nature, uh, all around us in biology, but also in in culture and civilization. So it's a it's kind of a, a meta level up from Darcy Thompson, and it has fewer pictures in it, but still it's it's a good book. 
So having prefaced uh, <clears throat> this uh, discussion, now we can jump into you know shells and grid shells. Um, so the fundamentals, what is a shell? A shell is a, is a curved surface in, um, in architectural um, terms. Usually it's made out of a solid material like uh, concrete, rammed earth, masonry, recently even timber, if you think about um, uh, something like CLT panels, uh, curved or faceted. So it's a solid curved shape. And a grid shell is the same thing except the material is discretized into um, two or three or more finite directions. Um, and nowadays you can have, you know, steel, timber, composites, GFRP, CFRP, aluminium. <clears throat> you can think of uh, a large palette of materials for these um, discrete um, elements. And they both have advantages. Um, for example, this is more transparent. You can have uh, light coming in, which is an architectural bonus. A shell of, made of concrete can give you thermal mass, opacity, better insulation. If your if your requirement, uh, if that's your requirement, so neither is better than the other one. They they can serve different purposes. Um, shells as I said, are, are structures or structural elements defined by a curved surface. They occur in nature, uh, example, seashells and uh, eggshells. And they are also artificial and in architecture. So Sydney Opera House is a good example. Um, also, if you look around your, your desks uh, right now, you probably see a lot of objects which can also classify as shells if you have a um, disinfectant bottle, you know, a can of uh, coke or something like that. These are all shells, um, shell structures. And shells are thin in the direction perpendicular to their surface and they transfer load using their curvature. So this is a key, um, a key factor. Speaking of curvature, um, I think we can go into a bit of um, geometry uh, presentation at this stage um just to refresh your memories so typically in the environment we work in a lot which is rhino um <clears throat> you have uh, surfaces and they have two parameters by which they are defined in this case we call them u and v parameters in in other books um such as i don't know if you can see this this is a classic book there's um, different notations, so lectures on classical differential geometry. But we have two parameters which define our, our surface. But there are two other important directions. So I want you to imagine yourself um, shrunk down to, to this point on an arbitrary surface, and you are, you know, you're perpendicular to that surface. And there are two specific directions along which if you walk your body, if you can visualize it, you walk along this direction, your body will just um, uh, lean forward or backwards. You will not lean left or right. You'll just keep going kind of vertically uh, leaning. And these two directions are called um, principal curvature directions. And there's always two for, for a given point uh, on a surface. And for another point on the same surface, the directions will, will have another uh, orientation, perhaps. Another way to visualize this, um, and why, why it's important to, to think about it like that, is because curvature um, is actually the inverse of a radius. So if you're sitting on, on this point here on the surface, if you cut a section through the surface, there is a, a principal curvature direction with a certain radius uh, slash curvature. And there's another one. In this case, this is a smaller radius, larger uh, <clears throat> curvature. And these two, these two principal curvatures, which we call K1 and K2, 
are important if we think about categorizing surfaces. Um, if we look at our uh, saddle shape again, <clears throat> Uh, we can define a property called Gaussian curvature, which is simply the product of the two principal curvatures for every point um, you're looking at. And in the red areas here, you see the product is taken as positive, which means positive Gaussian curvature, which is how you define a synclastic surface or a dome. Um, in the blue area, the product is negative, uh, which indicates an anticlastic surface, so a saddle, a Pringle shape. And if you if you imagine cutting the sections and looking at these circles there, you know you will see in the red area both circles are uh, on the same side of the surface. In the blue area, one circle is above the saddle and one circle in the other direction is below the saddle. So this is negative Gaussian curvature. <clears throat> and finally, we also have the condition where um, one of them, at least one of them is zero. So something like a cone or a cylinder would have one uh, zero curvature and the other principal one will have a, a value or uh, a sheet of paper will have both of them. A flat sheet of paper on your desk will have both uh, principal curvatures zero. Let me know if there's any questions along the way, as I said. So we have Gaussian curvature and another important measure is mean curvature. Um, mean as in, not as an evil, but as an average, um, which is simply the average of the two principal curvatures. And when the min mean curvature is zero, <clears throat> this indicates to us that we have a minimal surface, which is the surface formed by soap film <clears throat> physical models. Um, this is used in uh, form finding of tensile um, systems like membranes or cable nets. I want to move on to look at another way of visualizing these, um, this classification. So there is a way to, um, for every point um, on the surface to plot uh, curvature versus twist, uh, which can be defined mathematically. I'm not gonna go into, into details uh, right now, but using the equations, and if you plot them, you kind of figure out you have this kind of, um, uh, plot and you will notice the two points where it intersects um, the vertical axis the horizontal axis these are the principal curvature values and you can think of it very simply if they're both on the same side um, you'll have a, a dome a synclastic surface like an eggshell if one of them is negative one of them is positive as we saw before uh, you have an anticlastic or negative Gaussian curvature surface. If one of them is zero, which is the case of the cone, so along this generator line, curvature principal curvature is zero. Around the cone, there is a value, which depends on the radius there. So this gives us a uh, zero um, Gaussian curvature. Uh, if you're looking at a sphere, all directions are directions of principal curvature. Like if you're in Barcelona here and you you go in each direction, uh, follow the circle, it's all the same radius. So they're all principal um, curvature directions. And finally, going back to minimal surfaces, um, if they are both equal and of opposite signs, the the mean is zero, and then you get the soap film um, type surface. A very important surface is the developable one, which, as I said, you can identify by by it having Gaussian curvature uh, zero, and this is very important for us architects, engineers, because um, or product designers. Um, because these uh, surfaces can be unrolled and laid out flat. 
or if you think of it from a, a forming perspective, they start out flat and they can be um, rolled and molded into curved shapes. So going to the reason why this is important, um, the way shells work is they work through in-plane axial and shear stresses. So this is, um, you have two in-plane uh, axial stresses, which is simply, you know, force along this, this section in this direction and this direction. <clears throat> and then you have shear stresses. And quite often in reality, you also have a bit of a bit of bending going on. But principally, we want our shells to work in in compression or tension if it's if it's a hanging tensile system. And the reason curvature is important is um, because the loads that you apply to to your surface are balanced by the the membrane stresses I was talking about and their curvatures. Um, so in this case, you could have two different uh, curvature uh, radii, uh, more curved, less curved, and the way that interacts, uh, that geometry interacts with the, with the stiffness um, is how we resist the applied load. So th that's a key concept to think about. Curvature gives uh, shells uh, stiffness. Um, you cannot discuss how much curvature um, that's to do with how you build things as well, what material it's made of and so on and so forth. But the, the fundamental principle behind it is that the curvature resists the loads. Um, <clears throat> and I'll briefly mention here corrugations, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it later. If you add corrugations to your surface, um, that also helps increase uh, stiffness which in turn helps you carry more load. Any questions so far? If I'll give you five seconds, if I hear nothing, I'll continue. What do you mean with corrugations? Uh, corrugations um, are when, when you have something that's wavy like this. Um, Let me see. Can you see this now? Yes. 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 Uh, so if you you could have a you know a curved surface like this, or you could have something that it's it has these waves in it to some degree. So that's a corrugation. But is this like a, a shape uh, in the surface or, or? Yes, yeah, 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 yes, yes. Okay. Um, I don't know how, how that thing is called. Uh, this. So corrugation is is this kind of thing. Um, so if you had this steel plate across your your roof, if it was flat versus if it has these corrugations, this is much better, it's stiffer. Okay, yes, I was trying to imagine that in a, in a shell. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it, yes, it's a bit trickier, but it's the same the same principle. Okay, um, so the grid shells, the big idea uh, with timber grid shells came from Robert Hooke in 1675, uh, and he said, "As hangs the flexible line, um, so but inverted will stand the rigid arch." So he means this catenary, which is a, a wire hung from two points is in um, pure tension along the way. If you freeze the shape, reverse it, you get a pure compression arch. Um, so that's the big idea. But remember, this means optimization or this takes into account only self-weight. Because if you imagine there was wind blowing on this on this rope and it would be 
you know, it would have a different shape according to that load case, gravity plus wind. So this is a nice, pure, simple concept, but in, in reality, when we design things, we design things for more than one uh, load case. So that's a thing to, to remember. And the big idea came from, from this man, Fraiotto, who I'm sure you're um, familiar with. Who was a, he was a great architect uh, in the 20th century. Um, he, um, he gave us a lot of uh, interesting concepts um, <clears throat> and he left a lot of interesting buildings um, through his work. So what he did was he he thought about uh, Hook's idea of a, a hanging chain, and he thought about it: what if this was a hanging surface, a hanging uh, network, hanging sheet? And he applied that idea in the Essen grid shell in 1962, which was a a prototype. And he chose timber because timber is is flexible uh, enough to when it's thin and long to bend without breaking. That's why trees um, resist uh, the wind. They're long and, and thin and flexible. And he applied this concept to, to a mesh of, uh, of timber and he created this grid shell. And this was built flat and then um, it, it wasn't hung, but it was, it was lifted, it was pushed up uh, into shape. And I want you to notice um, these two diamonds. Um, so this was initially built flat and all the squares were square, but through this deformation, um, some of them became more diamond shape and some of them stayed more square. And this allows the, the formation to, to happen. Uh, And this was, yeah, this is a picture of it being uh, constructed. So as I said, it was built flat. Um, it was very simple. It was just straight bits of timber, two directions, one on top of the other, both through, same node everywhere, <clears throat> a bit of cutting and trimming around the edges, and then lift in place. And back in yeah in the early 60s, they were using physical models um, for both the form finding, as I said, the hanging hanging chain physical model, and also for load testing, as you can see here, uh, a perspex um, perspex model with nails hanging off it. Um, actually, I don't know. I hope you can see me. I would recommend you go find. Um, one of these if you have at home because this is pretty much exactly what the Essen grid shell is like. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, and you can you can play with it and get a feel for how, how this is moving. Uh, this also has kind of squarish uh, elements in the middle and a more diamondy here so it's exactly the same principle but also you can see how flexible it is um, and how how it works together if you push in one side how all of it deforms or there's deformation happening all around because it is actually working as a as a surface um, so yeah that's a it's a good one to to have a play with So Essen, the Essen prototype was then followed up uh, in 75 by the Mannheim Multihalle. Um, and I'm, I'm noting here that you have the same uh, principles, uh, flat assembly, repeated nodal connections, very simple fabrication, physical model, but it's like a thousand times more complicated, but the ideas that were here were taken to the next level here um, and it's it's quite an astonishing building and I'm still every time I'm, I'm still shocked that they were actually able to do it back then <laughs> and you can see here the hanging the hanging chain model that was used for the form finding um, which 
is pretty similar to to the sieve uh, situation. Um, before we go more into the specific projects, I think it's good to go through some uh, critical fundamentals. Someone has a dog in the background, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, the way the forces are transferred, we've talked about. We have the axial membrane forces and we have the surface um, uh, stresses, the shear stresses in a typical shell. If you make it out of a grid, discrete materials, you're, you're still able to carry the axial forces through the directions of the timber. And then you also need to carry the shear um, and there's different ways that you can you can do that, but essentially you need to brace the diamonds after you you've built it. So the force uh, system is is the same uh, for shells and for grid shells. Layers. Um, so layering, Essen had just a, it was a single layer uh, system, <clears throat> by which I mean there were two directions of timber and one layer in each direction. Um, however, so this depends on the material's ability to, to be flexible and to bend. However, if you want to span a larger distance, like Mannheim, which is 60 by 80 meters um, on plan, then you might find that your small section that you use, that you're able to bend, you can do that, but then it can't take any more um, applied load. So then what do you do? You double up. So you, you add uh, a second layer so that the force that is, uh, needs to be transferred is now taken by, by a composite um, uh, action of these two. So this allows you to still bend it in place, but also allows it to take the higher loads that um, come with that. And this bending and material uh, part is, is very important because it's what allows timber grid shells to be built as they are. But you also have to be mindful of it uh, and, and, and see what the limits are. So here you have the a basic uh, Bernoulli bending equation. Um, which under some assumptions describes what happens when, when you bend a beam. So the moment applied divided by the second moment of area is equal to the stress in the outer fiber, so at the extreme, divided by the uh, axis distance to that fiber. You'll see this in a minute. And this is also equal to the Young's modulus divided by radius or Young's modulus times curvature. Uh, these two are equivalent. So this links uh, all of our parameters, it links um, our forces, our material, our section properties, and our geometry. So for example, if you want to bend uh, your timber element, you want to check how much stress am I putting into it through that bending. So using these two, you can figure out that stress is Young's modulus times the axis distance divided by radius. So this is um, section property, material property, geometric, uh, yeah, geometry. So the stress that you put in due to bending, due to forming, you want it to be less than a fraction of your design stress. Your design stress, uh, call it sigma md, uh, can come from Eurocode 5, which has factors that you apply to the characteristic stress. So these are factors that, if you're unfamiliar with, <clears throat> Eurocode 5 tells you what kind of service class is my timber going to be exposed to. Is it outdoors? Is it indoors? Is it moisture? Have, is it uh, a very humid environment or not? Depending on that, there's a lot of factors that you apply to the basic stress capacity to get the design stress capacity. And then you say, okay, I'm going to bend my timber, let's say 
let's use 60% of this capacity for bending, which leaves 40% to um, the applied loads, which also generate um, stress. So this is a, a kind of uh, a basic and quite a good way to, to start looking at this. So if you were to design <clears throat> a timber grid shell, you would look at what kind of radius of curvature am I getting? What kind of material I'm using? Uh, and then kind of feed that in here and gauge where you are uh, on the surface. In different locations, you might have um, more bending stress and other locations less bending stress and so on. And just a quick reminder. So if this is my timber section, uh, this is the breadth, this is the depth. Second moment of area is BD cubed over 12. So the deeper this is, because it's cubed, the deeper this is, it quickly gets much stiffer. Um, this doesn't have such a big impact, but it can be important. And the axis distance is half the depth, because the most stress will be uh, in this layer and in this layer. So going back to this, <clears throat> What this series of equations can allow us to do is one, uh, check where we are with the forming stress, looking at this side. And on this side, we can also say, okay, I've applied this moment. Uh, I've got these sectional properties. I can figure out what the applied stress is. So if you combine the applied stress and the bending stress, it can get quite complicated if you're doing proper EC Eurocode checks and so on. And there's other uh, factors to consider. But basically, this can give you an idea of, of the bending, of the forming stress and this of the applied stress. And obviously, your material needs to take both um, because they both happen at this roughly at the same time. Any questions on this? No? Okay. Hopefully that's good. Uh, maybe you can insist on the leave room for the applied stress. Yeah, yes, okay. But um, I think it's really important, maybe not clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you imagine that you... Let's, Let's go back to this. If you imagine that you you have a section of, of timber which is 40 millimeters uh, deep and you calculate that it can bend to this radius here uh, and it's at 90% capacity um, when you bent it to this radius. <clears throat> what happens then when uh, there's wind load, when there's cladding load, when there's snow load, um, on top of that, which themselves, remember, they have safety factors uh, and so on. You only have that 10% room for this piece of timber, which is already quite stressed, to take more load before, before breaking. Um, so this leave room for, for applied stress, this is a bit of a... Um, it's a yeah it's a tricky one i can't tell you you know if 60 percent, 50 percent is the value to go for it has to be case by case basis you have to look at both your geometry and your structural analysis and you have to combine those and and judge those um, together carefully uh, i might touch touch on this later on uh, if i show you a project um so this kind of leads into the, the composite action between layers as well, because as I said before, um, you keep the member small so you can bend it more, but then it can't take as much load. So then you add a second layer <clears throat> and um, it's important that the two layers, they're obviously connected at the nodes of the grid, but you, you want them to be connected in between the nodes as well. And the shear block, which is a simple timber piece nailed through or uh, screwed or bolted, maybe even glued, 
which uh, ensures that between this node and this node, uh, these two are working together. Um, so they're not, uh, they're also less prone to buckling. So uh, they're working compositely together. What I'm saying is if you do a double layer and you don't put this in, you're losing a lot of efficiency. If you do put this in, you could even fill the whole gap in if you want, um, you know, aesthetically. But if you connect them, your efficiency will be um, greatly improved. Connections, the way you do connections uh, in these types of systems, um, we're looking at double layered uh, here. So the simplest one is just simple bolt through right in the middle. Disadvantages, this cuts a hole in your section, in your material. So you lose a bit of material here. Um, also, if it's double layer, you need to make slotted holes because if this is built flat and then pushed into shape, the layers will slide against each other and you need to allow uh, that to happen. So this is a very, um, yeah, the basic um, system. If you have a single layer, you don't need to make the slot. You just bolt through. An alternative, which, which came a bit later, was, okay, let's take the bolt out of the timber. Let's leave the section intact, which obviously is good for the, for the timber. And this kind of system with, with intermediate plates and four bolts, works very well, but it adds a bit of weight, adds a bit of cost, adds a bit of um, complication. Um, but these are options to consider. This gives you another advantage. Uh, if you have another, a third kind of um, layer that you're connecting to, uh, in this case, it would be a bracing layer, which we'll talk about uh, a bit later then you can use the same plate arrangement to to connect that to your node as well which is quite a quite an elegant solution <coughs> excuse me and finally if you have something which has a, a cladding mounting point you know you can integrate that into the plate uh, this was if you had like for example facade panels glazing you can build this all in one um, so this is also a very good option uh, depending on the project requirements. And uh, talking about bracing, bracing is very important. So here, a snapshot of Mannheim being built. Uh, you can see it was built flat and then pushed up and then curved a lot to get into shape. And um, this, the, the, the square to diamond deformation is what allows this to happen. But once this is finished, once you're in, in place, you don't want that flexibility anymore. So you want to lock the diamond in, in, in shape. And there's four fundamental ways how you can do that. One is to do a, a rigid connection. So you don't allow the rotation to happen here. But that's very hard to do, and people have thought about it. And you need to apply quite a lot of pressure to get enough friction to stop these things from rotating. And the amount of pressure you put, you end up crushing the timber. So it doesn't really work. So this doesn't really work for timber. <clears throat> Second option, which is what Mannheim used, is to put uh, cables through the nodes. However, cables only work in tension, as you know, so you need two directions of cables to fully brace the, the entire shell. <coughs> Sorry. So you need two directions of cable to brace the entire shell. <clears throat> and this is what they did in Mannheim. Um, Cables are quite small, not really noticeable, so it's not it's not a big deal, um, and they're very effective. Thirdly, you can use a uh, tension compression element, such as a just simple timber uh, beam, and you can put these in. This triangulates this 
diamond and stops it from 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 deforming <clears throat> and you can you can do it in any direction you want you can even change direction if you want uh, along the way um, but you have to do enough of them to to lock the entire shape in place <clears throat> and finally um, if you put a, if you manage to install a surface on top of your grid which is rigid this will also uh, prevent the uh, will brace the system think of um, um, simple timber walls where you have studs and plywood it's, it's the same kind of principle you have vertical and horizontal studs and then plywood boarding and that gives it uh, shear resistance in the plane in terms of construction so there's four ways to to achieve that one we've seen already Essen uh, lift up with crane um, so build flat lift up with crane pull the ends to where you want to because they're not gonna fall exactly where you want to secondly push up which is what they used for Mannheim so instead of lifting from above you push from below either yeah, with, with various with various system and with a lot of um, pushing points. Uh, thirdly, which is something which is a bit safer and more clever, uh, is you build everything flat but at an elevated location, and then you on scaffolding, and then you start to remove the scaffolding and you let gravity bring the the grid chill down to to a point, and then you you pull it to to the ends as well this was used at, in later examples I have a question. yeah well, would it be the less expensive method to lift this this kind of rituals um <clears throat> i think purely less expensive is is this but that's not the whole story because we've we've done a pavilion in romania where it was dirt cheap because we used student volunteers and we pushed it up, you know, manually. So that's, um, but then you think about uh, safety as well. And you also think about time. Um, so I think this is quite, quite a good system. Uh, you know, people who put up temporary works, scaffolding, they can go up quite quickly. Um, cranes are expensive so um that's one disadvantage here but if you do it in one go you can get the job done in two hours if it's a small one um and then crane can go um yeah so i think cost is a, definitely a, a, a good issue but you have to consider uh some additional parameters as well um, for small scale stuff, I think push up is probably the one that works the best. I don't know, Eric can probably uh, confirm. Actually, no, you guys used cranes as well. <laughs> but no, but I, I think it really depends on the case by case, as you were commenting, and it really depends on the scale. Yes. But maybe Jorge Adrian is asking maybe for your assignment, right? Yeah, in general, like, yeah. Well, but for just, us, I mean, in general, yeah. depends. In general, it depends. There are certain limits to what a crane can lift up, but you can put several cranes, but there are some limits. Okay. And for your case, for, for instance, making a scaffolding sounds like a little bit out of uh, circumstances. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but, but for, us, I, for us, it will be more like a push up, right? It's a little like. Yeah, or a lift up. I mean, it depends if it's very nifty, no, the, the, the movement. Yeah. I mean, if you can describe all your movement in a simple vertical displacement, a uh, crane is, uh, I mean, you call it, it's like one hour time, done. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Thanks. Um, and the fourth one, <laughs> Yeah, which is also worth mentioning because it's it's been demonstrated recently quite quite well um, by another uh, colleague of, of ours, Greg Quinn, is uh, inflation. So you you build it flat on the ground, but you put an inflated, uh, well, a, a non-inflated pillow underneath. Then you pump it up, and um, 
you you fix it to the base <clears throat> and then you can deflate this uh, back so this has a kind of re reusability uh, feature where for the same grid shell you know you can pop up the same grid shell uh, using the same cushion um, one question yeah does this pillow have to have exactly the same shape as the grid shell no I think it can be more as you see what I'm suggesting here more uh, a loose you know it um, doesn't approximate the exact shape but then you still have to pull it down to to the anchor points um, manually <clears throat> okay uh, a next uh, very important topic is buckling um, so I'm gonna try and briefly introduce the the concept and why it's why it's relevant so if we take it from from the basic column buckling so column buckling a column is a, is a simple vertical 1d system it takes um, a vertical load it's in compression and there is a certain load uh, at which point the column will buckle outwards <clears throat> in this kind of shape which is um, the column's way of resisting this load uh, by by deforming and by moving to another energy state um, if you will so buckling is a phenomenon that happens in in compression only systems it's highly non-linear as well and it can get very very complicated um, but you need to you need to be aware of it it also happens in in arches which is also a, a 1d system but it's curved and this is the kind of arch buckling shape that that you can get so you you keep loading your arch you keep loading you keep loading and at some point it pops into this shape um, obviously if you think about designing you know real usable buildings in theory this this would might not be a failure theoretically but if you have to deal with a real building uh usable spaces uh facade cladding uh, interaction of systems blah 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 you know having something like this happen would be considered a failure of that um of that uh, structure um moving on to shells same thing can happen in shells so if you have a cylinder um subject to compressive load <clears throat> at some point it might buckle locally by which i mean you'd have little uh, dimples and valleys on the surface which are local buckling um, effects or you can have a global buckling of the cylinder in which case the whole shape pops out like this which is essentially equivalent to to the column <clears throat> uh, system um, that's why we call it global because the whole the whole cylinder behaves as a column almost so it's a global effect whereas these are local effects so if this can happen in shells um it can also happen in grid shells uh, because they they work in the same way so these are some snapshots from a, a, a model of, from a project i'll show you later you have two directions of timber you have two directions of cables and this kind of shows some some buckle, buckled um, shapes these are more local as you can see like there's deformation more deformation here deformation here deformation here and what's interesting to notice in this case is that the bracing i was talking to you about the the cables <clears throat> kind of demarcate stiffer you know stiffer regions of the shell so the shell is more flexible in within this square than it is here and that's why the, the local modes in this case seem to to follow these um you know the the cable layout <clears throat> now you could come and say okay put a cable everywhere on every single um line but then that's much more work and it's not necessarily needed um, if, if Mannheim had a cable every six nodes in this design we had one every three nodes I think um, 
And then there would also be kind of global buckling effects where the whole shell would move. And you can study buckling yourself by, you know, if I push and it starts to pop in, that's, uh, sorry, that's buckled. That's a buckled shape. Now in this case, it's it's reversible, but yeah, that generally that's buckling. Um, <clears throat> so back to, to Manheim, any questions on, on any of these before we move on to the projects? Actually, maybe I want to mention something related to buckling, which is here, the composite layer. So if you didn't have a connection between these two members, this would be like a, a very thin column, and this would be like a very thin column, and it could buckle out. By connecting them together, they work as a more effective column, as a stiffer column. So that's why this this uh, shear block is important. And, and so, sorry, and this connection block uh, will be located on the whole surface. Yes, you you will see in the in the projects. It's it's in every in between every node. You typically you would have this. Okay. <clears throat> Back to Mannheim. Um, this is a, quite a recent picture of the, the big dome. Uh, I want you to pay attention to this area here. <laughs> so Mannheim was built in 75. It was supposed to be up for two years, I think, maximum. So now it's been many, many years later. Um, and it suffered a lot of damage in the meantime. So there's a bit of buckling happening here, a bit of deformation. That's why they put these props. And you'll also notice this scaffold tower, which is um, helping prevent a uh, a dimple. <clears throat> so it essentially it's buckled at the top. And I hope you can you can tell if you if you imagine this uh, dome, the timber line should just kind of go smoothly down, but you can see if you follow it as it inflects down and then kind of back up and then back down. So there's a dimple that's <laughs> that's formed here after so many years, uh, which is similar to what I was showing you kind of here. Um, I'm, I think it's worth uh, seeing a, a quick video uh, about, um, about Mannheim because it, it helps wrap your head around like the scale of the structure and how complicated it is. So it's only like a minute and a half, but I found a, a section of a video. It's in German, so I'm gonna mute it for now. And so this is a video showing the, the inside and it gives you a perspective of, of the, the scale. So there's there's tunnels happening, there's pathways, there's two big domes, there's arch arches. Um, so you can kind of see it's a very, very complicated um, system. You can see the bracing cables like there, one every six nodes. Um, at the moment, it's it's suffered quite a lot of damage, and there's been a resurgence of of interest in preserving it. Um, so this is the big dome, and this is the smaller 40 meter span. This is 60 by 80. This is a guy explaining something about the modeling. You can <laughs> see there in the background. You'll notice this. This is a temporary um, support. This is not there in, in the beginning, but I think these, these beams are failing. So it's been deemed dangerous. Uh, these are some, some sketch drawings of the, the connections. I think there's a bit, there you go, that's the, um, the hanging chain model <clears throat> and the boundary that was that was used to model the whole shell. 
so i think this the model is made from its little um yeah like chains and then little loops that 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 intersect that connect the make form the grid this is an SN model i think which is the building we saw before This is amazing. Back when I was studying these for the first time, there were no videos of Mannheim. And this is the big dome. You can see it's quite it's quite curved in areas. It's smoother in, in other areas. There's the props I was talking to you about. And there and there's the it's not really what you want to see, right? In the middle of your dome. <clears throat> okay, back to this. I hope you can see the presentation again. Yes. Cool, thanks. Um, so if we talk a bit about Mannheim, um, a few of the details, and you'll see some of the things we, we talked about in the fundamentals section. So the connection was a simple bolt through they were using a disc spring so they were using a kind of a spring which you if you tighten the bolts this would <clears throat> apply a bit of pressure here and they wanted to do that in order to create friction between this timber and this timber and this timber and this timber to help it to stop them from rotating the timbers are 50 by 50 mil uh, important to remember so and there's two double layer, but it's just five centimeters square, which is amazing. The shear block <clears throat> here, they used um, kind of wedge pieces um, to wedge against each other uh, and bolt it through. It's important to note that these uh, shear blocks, they're added after you formed. So when you form the grid shell, you just have the four layers, that's it. Um, and the connections between the nodes but then everything else comes later so the shear blocks this is a typical boundary connection so you have a concrete foundation a steel stub bracket uh, plywood boarding on that edge and then bolt through the the grid shell so all the loads come down and then they're taken through shear in the bolt into the plate and into the steel steel stub um, the diagonal cables as i mentioned um, crossing every every six six nodes um, <clears throat> they are made so that they cross in the middle of a square you don't want them crossing at a node because it makes your node more complicated and there's no need. So if you offset one, you, you end up with this, which is a, a cross in the middle. And each node is, is simpler. Um, here you also see a cladding preparation. So it's some of these timbers you see on top, they are for the cladding mounting. So they, they come again after you've curved it and, and stabilized and braced the shell. You come and you do... Um, you know, cladding, mounting points, and so on. Uh, splice joints. So here you can see a typical splice joint, um, which is how you how they achieve these very very long timbers. Uh, obviously, this doesn't come in <laughs> as one. You don't order a eighty meter long um, fifty by fifty mil section. So they're spliced spliced together. Uh, something I want to focus on a bit is, uh, and something that people don't often talk about with Mannheim, is the variety of boundary conditions. Like, not only did they give themselves this crazy shape, but they also gave themselves, they made the, the, the architects and engineers' jobs uh, more difficult by doing different boundary conditions. So, when they say here concrete boundary, I think it means uh, what I've shown you before, a concrete foundation and a steel stub so that's the easy one then there's arches 
Um, these you need to think about because obviously you need to access your grid shell, otherwise it just sits there being pretty. So you need arches for the entrances. <coughs> and there's a section of laminated timber beams. So around here you would have uh, columns and then you'd have a, a glue lamp beam between the columns and the glue lamp beam would pick up the, the shell. And finally, the cable boundary, which is the wackiest of them all, which is a, a, a tensile um, a, a tensile boundary supported by by columns in between. So this is the cable boundary. Um, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to be able to go visit a few years back and, and I, I took this picture and I was impressed at the variety of the edge conditions. Um, so this is a kind of a tensile cable, which is picking up um, an edge, uh, a sandwich, a plywood sandwich package, which collects the grid shell itself. But it's it's resting in tension on the, this cable, which is picked up by the columns. And this is a, a typical arch entrance. So again, you see, this is important because it's um if you this might get very curved uh, and very twisty if you just randomly cut your surface <coughs> it, it could get very twisty and it could get very hard to fabricate you have to think about curvature tangent of the surface how it lands on on onto the arch and you have to consider those kind of things Obviously, if you have a lot of money and you CNC machining and so on, you you know you can you can build uh, a big chunk of glue lamp and machine it to the right shape and orientation. And now, yeah, I wanted to show a few pictures that that I took of the damage. So, as I said, the buckling of the the dimple in the dome, which is which is shown here. Then I noticed this area in which all of these looks like looks like those um, splices, but I don't think this was designed <laughs> given the the layout. So it's either breakages which happened during um, during the construction, or subsequent repairs in the in the years that that came later. But it's very noticeable. Um, so if you're looking for you know it's not slick, it's not smooth. <coughs> Um, there's some damage here where on, on one of the beam edges the, the grid is completely missing, the cable seems to be doing something weird and I don't know exactly what's happened but it's it's in quite in a bad shape. And this is that temporary support I was, you saw in the videos. So this is a laminated timber beam, probably yeah, a glue lamp beam, which collects the grid and it was supposed to span between here and here, but it's probably been deemed um, dangerous <clears throat> by the municipality. So there's ongoing efforts right now to, to give it a new life. Uh, there's a renewed interest in the last few years um, in preserving this, especially since Fry Otto was given the Pritzker Prize. Uh, it kind of it, it, it got new life, this movement. So I hope they succeed in doing something with it. Moving on to the Weldon Downland Open Air Museum. So this this comes, what, almost 30 years after uh, Mannheim. Some of the people who were involved in Mannheim, like Chris Williams, was also involved in this. Um, so this is a, a workshop building. This features corrugation. So this is a, a like a vault which has this corrugation on it um, we were talking about earlier and you were, you were asking me to visualize it. So this is, this is um, something that you can think of. This grid shell features um, quite a few nice things. So one, there's a one by one grid, but there's areas where it's half a meter by half a meter grid. This, I don't remember if it's aesthetic or structural, but it, it could be could be both. Um, secondly, the bracing is done using um, rigid timber elements. And in this section, they run horizontally. 
in the middle section they run vertically across the top so quite a nice detail there um i think it's a beautiful space they've used cladding very cleverly so there's there's opacity here there's light coming in at a nice level for for the workshop uh, workers so they restore um old buildings in here um as i said the bracing runs horizontally <clears throat> up to here which probably helps with the cladding and then from here it runs across the dome which again helps with the cladding the connections are the ones uh, we've talked about you can see it in action here so the plates with the four bolts uh, i'm focusing on this line here because you can just see one uh, the horizontal bracing element I think here there's two, this is the bracing element and this is probably something to do with the cladding fixing because this runs node to node. You can see the shear blocks. In this case, they've put two um, everywhere. So on all, all the members. <clears throat> and it's what's actually nice is they are a little bit recessed. Uh, I think that's to do with, with tolerance and aesthetic. So it's like, I don't know, one centimeter less wide than the, the main element but to answer one of the earlier questions yeah it applies everywhere on on all the members Savile Garden um, this came in 2005 by pretty much the same people so Bureau Happold were involved in the engineering of both of these uh, and over Arab of Mannheim but there is crossover in the people who are who are involved in all of them. This is quite different than the previous ones. So the grid shell is all elevated on a on a steel edge. Um, it's much shallower than the other ones, but it's it's a very nice architectural, um, you know, visitor center for this this um, this uh, Windsor Park in the, near London. <coughs> It's a beautiful structure. This was built um, flat at an elevated level, and then the scaffolding was low, removed, and the, the grid shell was, was lowered. One interesting difference here is they built the first layer first. Um, they deformed it. They put the shear blocks actually. So they built the first layer with the shear blocks in place, flat. Then it got deformed and uh, partly attached to, to the edge beam. And then they put on the second layer. <clears throat> so the sequence here was um, steel edge first, layer one shear blocks flat, deformed, and then layer two um, attached. You'll also notice here double height shear block. So by that I mean <clears throat> it's twice the height of the, the member. And that's because uh, by putting uh, twice the height, you have a stiffer composite action between between the two layers, uh, between, yeah, between the, the two members here so it's a higher distance it's like a steel i-beam the the flanges are further apart so it's more it's more efficient <coughs> sorry and finally another uh, interesting feature is that they they use plywood um, as a membrane bracing so this shows the fourth uh, actually the third feasible type of bracing we talked about which is a uh, creating an actual surface <clears throat> which braces the the diamonds it's quite a nice one and it's quite yeah i think these two weldon downland and savile they they together they brought a lot of um technical progress to the art of the grid show and finally yes. Sorry, there's a question. Can I ask a question about the previous project? Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. Like, how do, how do we, um, how do they know if these pieces are flat? The plywood that they put in between the each rectangle. I don't think it's flat, but I think um, <clears throat> it it twists and bends a little bit. 
but if it if it's um, nailed down sufficiently along the edge, you know, the plywood is quite flexible as a board. So it's not it's not a f it's not perfectly flat. It follows the shape of the of the diamond. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But it's not like they uh, they I don't think they specified curved plywood. It's not it's not worth it for for this. I think it's just it's just manhandling it, you know, nailing it down. Um, because this was I don't know if it was one meter section or something like that, and there's not a lot of um, curvature going on. Okay. Um, finally, I just want to touch on a, a project I've been involved in with recently. Um, spent most of like half half of last year with AKT working on it, and I think uh, it's recently been been published on, on Design Boom. <clears throat> so there's I think I can talk about it. Um, so this is a, a luxury development in in the Red Sea, um, and it uh, is meant to be yeah extreme like six star level luxury <clears throat> it's a it's an open air hospitality kind of um, guest hub uh, arrival experience um, it's an exposed structure and we we proposed so these two are our timber timber grid shells um, so this is kind of the, the structural scheme that we ended up with. Uh, it's glue lamb arches. It's two directions of double layer timber and uh, the, the cables for bracing. But to reach this point, we went through a lot, a lot, a lot of iterations. The surface was quite fixed by the architects, um, as in we didn't have much room to, to form find any surface. So actually our job was was quite hard we had to find a grid on a given surface <clears throat> and initially we were looking at uh, three-way um, grids and that proved very hard so we were always controlling uh, for curvature and you can see a lot of them were were failing so by which I mean they would have to be bent uh, in shape to an uh, excessive amount of stress already, so it it would it wouldn't work. <clears throat> um, and in this case, we were actually looking at normal curvature and also geodesic curvature, so curvature in in the plane of the surface combined. But in the end, uh, we convinced the architects to to go for two two layers, uh, two directions, and then cables. <laughs> which gave us the freedom to actually try and make these directions a bit more geodesic, so eliminate a lot of curvature. Um, and yeah, so it was it was a lot of a lot of iterations. I guess what I'm saying is this is not a nice ideal form found hanging chain kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but I think we're reaching the point where with timber manufacturing technology and computational power, we can actually um, design something like this. I'm not saying that's necessarily a good thing, but yeah. These are some of the, the details we were looking at. Um, as I said, we had um, timber bracing as the third layer at some point, but also curved. That was the that was the complication. So all the elements I talked about were we were discussing and implementing shear blocks, um, bolts, um, <clears throat> etc we had to resort to even splitting the section into thinner pieces um, in order to achieve the curvatures that we needed in some areas um, which yes uh, it was slightly unfortunate but yeah that that's what the engineering required we also thought about uh, construction so this is a proposed sequence again cannot be done by building flat and folding into place. It's not that kind of grid shell. Um, but we were proposing a, a system by which we we have to internally support the grid uh, all along the way. But we can start by um, by putting like a, a, a less dense mesh, then completing the mesh, second layer, third layer, um, uh, and then tightening everything in place 
quite labor intensive, quite expensive, but yeah, I think the client can afford it. We were looking at uh, <clears throat> some of the things that we talked about earlier, stress, bending stress. Uh, so the forming stress, we with with four laminations in each element, they they had individual bending stresses. Then we had the uh, working bending and working axial stresses, and we we're using this kind of computational flow to um, to get analysis results as well as uh, geometric uh, forming results. Combine everything and and check for for utilization. So it. Um, quite involved, but it it's it touches on the fundamental things that uh, we talked about earlier. And this is just a nice plot showing how it deforms. Um, again, I see I see analogies to to the sieve to this. So physical models are always good for. Um, for for these um, for replicating the behavior of these kind of structures and uh, yeah so here we're looking at utilization <clears throat> for different load cases and you can see again what i mentioned earlier different load cases put higher utilization in different areas of the structure so when we actually design it can't be just a single load case you have to consider everything that's that's required um, <clears throat> and finally, an, another, yeah, just an aspect of the workflow is we did all this work in Rhino, all the computation, optimization, analysis, post-processing, and then also using Rhino inside, we were um, importing it straight into Revit uh, as, as a, into our CAD model, uh, helping us prepare, prepare drawings and so on. So it, it was quite an involved process, but we touched on, um, a lot of the uh, this the initial scheme stages the optimization the post-processing everything was in the same computational environment and you can see how it's all very linked together when you when you design um shell structures grid shell structures tensile structures it's all related back to geometry and processing the geometry and understanding that so back to your projects. Um, I hope you you enjoyed you enjoyed the talk. Uh, I love these pictures; they're amazing. I think they're beautiful models, and I can't wait to see yours. Thanks. Thanks, Lado Um uh, Can you leave your presentation for a moment? Because uh, maybe I'm sure uh, the students have some questions, even me. Sure. Uh, should I put it up again? Uh, yeah. yeah yeah so normally i i give the um, the word to the students or to the audience but in this case i'm going to be a little bit egoist and i'm going to start asking okay. so now i'm just very curious on the on the process of um fabrication of some the assembly of the grid so i have yeah. two questions first two questions so um can you go back to the, the 58 uh, slide well, any, any 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 of those actually? Yeah. So the the bracing is actually uh, so in this in this picture shows everything is braced, but in some yeah. others you have this diagram <clears throat> of red. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it initial initial design had um, three layers of double. Uh, let me jump up. So three layers of three directions of double layer timber was okay. initial design. But and the third one was curved as well. So uh, weld and downland had just straight uh, pieces. This was meant to be continuous and curved as well. But um, I convinced the architects that it's better to <laughs> to get rid of that and put cables. Of course. Instead. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> because no, no, wait, doing totally. three way on a yeah. given surface is very hard. And and actually, in terms of, I mean, so at the end is at the end is this scheme in cables. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The end uh, is well, this scheme. Yeah. When you see the pictures of, of I mean, if you can, if you can put cables, no, like the the the, the Mannheim is just uh, displaying itself. No, they they become invisible. The scale, no, the, when you see them backlight, it's impossible to see. 
Yeah. Okay, great. Can um, I say something on that? Yeah, yeah. Even on that point, we had conversations with architects saying, because in Rhino, you pipe something that is, you know, small yeah. radius. They would be, ah, it's a bit, it's a bit thick. It's a bit obvious, isn't it? Like, no, it's not going to be obvious. <laughs> So, uh, but can, can you go to the uh, couple of uh, slides more when you uh, construct? Ne no, next, next. Here, yeah, here. So, uh, the previous one. Yeah. So, um, you mean they are literally formed by by four uh, little planks? So they are laminated in situ. Yes. Wow. So and then I, and then they are I, like nailed I or screwed. It. Yeah, either in situ or um, it would be pre pre formed into into this shape. But it doesn't seem apparently it doesn't seem to be like um, maybe I am wrong with the scale, but it doesn't seem to be have like such curvature. So, so um, yeah, so. we were using. Um, properties from Akoya wood because it's exposed so it's it's a treated wood okay. and yeah once Perfect. you start to to put in the factors of, of yeah, yeah, yeah. sigma mk um if you have like c24 which starts yeah. at 24 mpa you you're down to 12 just from the factors yeah. and then from the 12 maybe you use six or seven mpa for for bending to leave another six to <laughs> to the apply yeah. Yeah, you have yeah so very this, few margins. This was our solution to to it. Okay. Um, okay. No, I, for for this type of uh, of structure, I mean, uh, I have my my dots also. If it's a grid shop, if it's like a combined, no, like a glue lamp structure with coverings, no, if there is a principal and secondary structure, but still, it's a, a very nice uh, grid shop. So uh, for for you all the students, you can see that um, now they are coming back the grids. So all the the best um, offices in the world are, are building timber grids. So it's a very good excuse to you for you to learn. Okay. Um, yeah. So guys, do you have questions? Yeah, yeah. I, I got the one little question. Um, this in this project, it, it looks like it's uh, symmetrical. Yeah. Um, but the the wind loads. Uh, well, the, the simulation of the wind uh, comes from one direction. Um, the, the, the city, I mean, the, uh, it pushes yeah. one direction. So wouldn't it be? I mean, the, the is is the simulation of the of the wind uh, in that exact uh, place? So this is just showing like one direction of the wind, mm -hmm. um, but we looked at combinations and the other direction as well. Um, I just put this put this far for the oh, yeah. but so it's it's for like any any kind of dome shape you have pressure on this side and you have suction on the other side but there's more pressure here <clears throat> so okay. this was you know following euro code um uh -huh. spe specification okay thank you i have a question yeah. Uh, is there a cladding for the, like, for this new chat? Is there a shading uh, cladding? Yeah, there is shading. Uh, the idea is to, it has a rope cladding. So I don't know if, if you can, it basically kind of hanging rope on top. Um, and it's very thick, thick rope with gaps in between. So it, it has this very, um, yeah, just purely shading. Uh, it's not even opaque, so air it's permeable to to air as well. And of course, when you did the wind load, you uh, you you did like the wind load on the surface, not on the timber itself, no, like on the whole surface. Of the... Yeah. So it, what you can do uh, typically is you you do it on the surface, and then you can consider a certain amount of porosity. Um, okay. And reduce your wind load proportionally to that. But there's also some guidance uh, in in design codes um, for how to do that. For it's uh, applied it comes from like open mesh weaves, you know, like panels. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I was just thinking that uh, you could have 
use a layer to strengthen, like instead of the maybe the cables, the, the diagonal cables could be replaced with the maybe by the final layer being acting as a let's say structural element too, or is it more expensive in terms of? So you get the cladding to be used for. Yeah, like the like the sheet, like the, the thick layer of ropes you're seeing, you're placing yeah. on top. Could also uh, instead of the cables, like uh, like the holding fixing elements of the grid, or is it yeah. a bit? Or we didn't we didn't quite think of that. Uh, the idea from the architects was to have very dense, um, like very dense kind of rope. So. Yeah, I think that would be very complicated to connect it to the nodes and to the to the beams. So actually, okay. it's the other way around. We use the cables to temporarily kind of support the not temporarily, but to to pick up the rope from the glue lamp via cable, 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 cable. Oh. Lamp. So it's the other way around. Okay, so so at the end you are doing like a like I'm sorry to say like this one well, not you eh but the um, the chosen uh, assembly uh, process at the end is uh, literally the worst case let's say one by one <laughs> yes okay but yeah. you take you take uh, so you take this in advantage for the lamination right so you don't need to to do prefabricate well yeah apparently. I think you know this was still um, in discussions with contractor and so on. You could do prefabrication as well, and I think we were pushing for that because this is in a remote location. So the less okay. you do, yeah, on yeah, site, the better. Um, but uh, you could actually take advantage, as you say, and laminate on site, or okay. you could pre-do it and and bring each each long piece and like kind of stretch it across okay. temporary support but but okay but so it is it looks like a, uh but it, it's far from being a chevy net right yeah yeah no so it doesn't okay simply like it minimizes a little bit the geodesic curvature and that's it in the final it's they're very close to geodesics on the surface very close yeah okay um and and i'm something i'm very very interested if you can go to the uh the next layer so oh, next slide, yeah. next slide. Sorry. Yes. So this is the. Uh, I'm very interested in, the, very curious in the the, the different shear block. And mm -hmm. actually, this is something we commend with the students that they have the capacity to have a, a variable um, structural height mm -hmm. yeah, according to the to the uh, to the structural needs. Mm -hmm. So, um, how this was distributed or spread? Well, this is. It's not so much variable there's two situations there's okay. there's um i like where you're going though and i'll talk about it but basically in between this is a typical case where the shear block is as high as the element but the third layer we put one on the outside one on the inside so the block in between has right. to be thicker because it's this this orange layer sandwiches the other ones <laughs> Um, so the gap is bigger there. But I want to talk about, um, you raise a good point. I want to talk about this. So if you do it like this, as Enrique said, you these could be machined or yeah, to be, to have variables. So this could start from uh, 40 mil, could go up to 80 mil gap, could go back down to 40 mil. Um, and you would have like a, you know, a muscular, like a muscle kind of, it's, it's, it's wider where it needs to be and uh, thinner where it's less, um, less loaded. And I think that's something that I was like thinking about during my, my MPhil way back when, I think it's a, it's a cool idea um, and it's worth looking into. So yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it. Well, I'm not sure why you would, I mean, you would reduce slightly, not the density, no? I mean, once you are able to have such a thickness, I mean, the idea of reducing it, no? it would be only for the big parts, no? To just reduce a little bit the, the, the stress, right? Or yeah, well, it, it's I am. Um, I think the calculation is more complicated, but you know, the stiffness goes with the depth um, cubed. So in the composite system. 
the depth increases quite a lot between the two the two elements if you increase the shear block so that could give you quite a lot more stiffness <clears throat> so maybe it would be um yeah it would be better responsive to higher loads for example um yeah but but i mean once once i mean if your system is allows you to have like a huge uh, shear block height i mean mm -hmm. why wouldn't you have it like for everywhere i mean i mean the the point of having a variable thickness i i guess is when you when you really need to have to to reduce the the self weight no locally so when you i mean yeah, that's a good point maybe it could be uh, it could be architectural um but in terms of structural if you put in the cost of doing it and blah 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 and the effort of changing yeah. it you will end up as you say what they did here which is um yeah double up everywhere <laughs> that's it i mean it I, I'm I'm rephrasing my own question. So, so at the end, it's like it's it's very cool, yeah. But I mean, it really depends. So definitely, uh, maybe around the supports, if you really need to, you know, like to get, you no, know, yeah. maybe maybe if you if your boundary is not continuous, you no, know, and suddenly you have like you no, know, like um, let's say like arches, you no, know, like concentration of, of places, and then maybe you really need to to increase the structural height because uh, you, you have a lot of moments there. But yeah. maybe. I was um, thinking of, of the base as well, like you could open yeah. up towards the base, um, like a tree trunk kind of, yeah. Exactly. And my 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 last question is, uh, here, uh, did you have to increase the section towards uh, fire protection? Uh, no. Because... In the project um, I worked on. You mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah no 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 because it's open it's uh, exposed okay there's no door it's like completely it's just a shade it's a shading device okay that's nice <laughs> yeah no um, uh, oh, oh, yeah no, go ahead. i mean otherwise you get a a, a penalty you know, by the fact of having so much exposed uh, faces yes yeah yeah, yeah. okay but Go generally ahead, also on fire i think um sometimes you know a lot of the structure is away from things that can burn because it's you know it's a high dome whatever so you need to be careful around the sides um, more than everywhere i would guess okay go ahead Sen. um i have a question regarding the connection Mm -hmm. um, can I not use any metal in the connection, just use the uh, oriental Japanese way of connecting wood together, or it wouldn't work? Um, <clears throat> good question. So for connections, uh, let's... So if you build it flat and you and it's square and you deform it, the connection needs to allow rotation until until um, until this has become a diamond and this has become so it needs to allow this rotation to happen and then um, yeah you lock it in place so you need to think of a system that allows that rotation to happen um, if you want to do it without without metal um <clears throat> i don't know the only thing i can think of is is maybe something like uh, bamboo lashes <laughs> but i don't know if you know a very loose but you still want to keep it in place like you have you want to keep this point fixed between the two elements but you need to allow rotation to happen okay. i think that's that's a tricky one um it could be a timber dowel, maybe, or um, yeah. And the dowel would allow the rotation. It would allow rotation the same as the bolt, but then uh, it wouldn't fix the things into place later on. I think. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll think about that one. And... 
if something good comes up, <laughs> I'll text Enrique. Okay, great. I have one question. Mm -hmm. It's about the share blocks. I'm just asking if you could replace them by uh, small columns or steel columns. Like I'm not. I know that they would be much more expensive. But <laughs> like I don't care about the money, but the function mm -hmm. of these share blocks. It's just about avoiding backlink. So you would replace it by a steel column, like the really small one. So it would be. Would do the same as it as the share block. When it you, would. But it will have to be quite, you know, like relatively big, if I can, like relatively chunky. It can't be like a bolt. Mm -hmm. It can't be just a bolt. It can be, yeah, maybe a lot of bolts together. Or if you want steel, um, I'm sure there's there's things you can think of. You can you can put you know a couple of cables across. Um, mm -hmm. Again, super expensive, super tight space. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But in theory, your concept is right. You want to join these two uh, elements so they work compositely. So anything that you can put in there to achieve that would work. But there's the other uh, considerations. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, but not having like bolts uh, wouldn't the wood timber like lose a bit of its characteristics because you're inserting yeah let's say, per, um, it would modify things um a bit i think probably the, the the best way is is a timber piece and then if you don't want to bolt through just like uh angled screws like cross uh, sorry nails like cross nails uh i think that would that could do the job quite well <clears throat> Actually, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Enrique, I don't know. This seems very complicated as well, um, with the folding and three bolts. But yeah, anyway. No, what I was going to say is that uh, I mean, if you if you extend this idea to the maximum, I mean, um, if you go to the Savile Garden picture on the fabrication, I mean. Uh, one option would be like uh, mechanize this, but without um, without adding it. But let's say that you have like a like all these uh, massive lath, okay, mm -hmm. and then you just make these cuts like like a curve bending, and then you just allow so you the the saw just enters the height of the shear block, okay, and you and you just leave some spacing, and then when you bend it. So what the the, what the the only thing you bend is just the the height of your of your supposed uh, plank, okay? But yeah. then I mean everything is like uh, everything is like a continuity of shear block, like except yeah, but, these little but angles. You'd, still, you'd have a lamination here. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying make I mean, for the students as well. Yeah. You're saying make this like complete huge. big huge timber piece that you see and see a gap out of. No, right. But but you could you could uh, the gap could be just for um, in certain occasions, but normally just yeah, a, a little a little just saw. Just yeah, just just a saw so from time to time, and then you would just let it open, just the minimum amount. Yeah, I, I think it would be like much more heavy, and <laughs> yes. but you wouldn't you, you you but but you don't need to uh, post process, no? so you don't need to like keep on gluing or screwing or nailing it. Yeah. I mean, already in, in there so basically um uh, just like a um a comparison dragos was talking about c24 and we are so it, the, the 24 means 24 megapascals and he's halving it to 12 and um and he's halving it again so one part to what he was saying to preserve to have like a little storage of uh, stresses and another because the sigma uh he 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 has to consider the material is worse than than the Westland to be. So uh, let's say that we can have twice the, his values. Okay, the sigma we are having is fifty. Okay, because we use like posh LVL <laughs> that make things like <laughs> uh, yeah curvier. Okay, mm. if you keep LVL. Okay, so sigma MD would be fifty. 
Yeah. Or, or, M, or the... MK, uh, the characteristic would be 50. Characteristic would be 50. Yeah. That's good. 